Uh, Sandeep, are you here? I'm here. How are hey. you, Gabriel? How are you? Hey, I like the getup. Is that Philip Plain? What do we got here? Hey, we got we got a little Philip Plain, but you know, Plain. given that it's such a serious yeah. conference, I, I thought of putting a shirt on. I, you know what? We're at the intersection of culture and technology with the new wave forward Tiktalia. So we we can appreciate a little bit of Plain here. Um, Wonderful to have you joining us all the way. Thank you so much. And thank you to Tectalia. Yeah. So I wanted to jump right into it because we don't have a ton of time. Um, yeah. Bridgeport Capital, you guys sit at basically, you're in Singapore. You're looking at everything that's happening from Southeast Asia to China to all over in Asia, focused primarily you know, on NFTs, right? Uh, we had a great conversation before this, this call talking about your contrarian viewpoint of NFTs versus crypto. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then about the background of uh, Bridgeport? Sure, sure, Gabriel. Uh, so once again, thank you so much. And, you know, uh, Gabriel, last time we were talking about this, right? So I've been involved with blockchain since about 2012, 13, started actively investing in cryptocurrencies and I come from a financial world, right? So, you know, for me to look at cryptocurrencies uh, was so difficult because, you know, when you have an asset that has 80, 90% volatility, right? It goes up, down, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. And for cryptocurrencies to get institutionalized, there has to be some sort of risk management, right? right. So we, we, we've looked at different asset classes, et cetera. For me, what was really interesting was the NFT market, right? So the NFT market, you know, despite the crypto's peaks and troughs, I saw the NFT prices holding together. So the way I looked at it from a balance sheet perspective, if my crypto holdings are the liability side of the uh, a balance sheet, then the NFTs are the asset side of the balance sheet, right? So, you know, in the old days, um, people used to diversify art assets, right? To yep. diversify the portfolio, right? And it, it was basically an uncorrelated asset because if you look at um, art as an asset class in 2020, it was about 0.12 correlation coefficient vis-a-vis -vis the S&P 500. So if you have a very, very low coefficient, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting, right? So it, it, it adds as a diversification tool. Got it, understood. So, you know, we're in this land of peaks and valleys of crypto, looking at NFTs, you know, in general, is this now is this asset class. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, about your background, how you got into it and why you're so bullish on NFTs right now? All right, so, so you know, my background is, you know, I graduated college. I sold my soul to finance. So I used to uh, be in private yeah. equity yeah. at J.P. Morgan Partners. And then you worked for the devil, is that what we call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, right? So then I, then I was with AIG and doing investments. And, and frankly, uh, I, I, I really uh, got encapsulated with the whole philosophy of the whole blockchain, the world of decentralized. And, you know, when I segment uh, the whole NFT space, um, you know, the whole concept of the ability for people to earn from it. And I, I will talk about this. And of course, I've always been in gaming. I've loved that whole space. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we were always looking at new ways of doing things. And, and the new decentralized world uh, is absolutely phenomenal. Like if you actually look at the global collectibles market, right? From toys and cards and playing cards and upper deck and everything, that's a $370 billion market, right? Um, and I only have last year's stats, right? The NFT market in 2020 was about $338 million, right? So that almost, you know, mathematically equates to almost a thousand percent potential growth into that space. And as you look at fashion, as you look at branding, as you look at gaming, as you look at collectibles, right? Um, and art and that convergence, it, it, it's actually pretty phenomenal. So that was the reason uh, that caught my eye. But more importantly, 
for the blockchain, the NFTs also represented a first real use case, right? Yep. People have been doing DeFi, people have been talking about payments, people have been talking about a lot of things, but you know, art is art, right? It's collectibles, it's what I like, I like. And with the new generation that's coming in, the metaverse is becoming more and more important. So for brands, right? I mean, you're in Italy, you're, you're at the heart of fashion, you're at the heart of the coolest people in the world. My favorite cities uh, are, are there. And, you know, it just comes down to... And, every, every, and, and, and to be totally clear, everybody's talking about NFTs here. It's kind of the first phenomenon I've seen in crypto where they're talking about NFTs, they're working on it, and they're excited about it. You know, something with fashion is fashion usually moves pretty slowly to these trends. And they're still moving slowly from a colossal standpoint. But I, I'm seeing it in my conversations here with, you know, uh, individuals that work in the in the fashion industry. So, you know, thinking about it a little bit further, um, you know, as this asset class, do you see, you know, a use case beyond just a digital item, right? It, or, or is there is there a component that that you um, at Bridgeport, you know? Uh, are looking at that can have more of a real world value? Is it, you know, attaching the NFT to a ticket? Is it attaching NFT to a shoe? Is it, can you, can you tell us a little bit about insights on that and where you think the future lies? Uh, so, by the way, NFTs, just like art, it's, it's just a big world, right? I, when you talk about brands, you talk about licensing, you talk about, but you know, one of the big things that's happened is the metaverse has become all of a sudden very, very real, right? Yeah. If I was to segment, the NFT world into three distinct components, right? One component is the asset, right? So I'm buying digital art. I'm buying, you know, from top shelf, I'm buying, you know, LeBron James, you know, uh, shooting that one amazing hoop. Uh, yep. So that's the asset piece of it, right? The second piece that's very, very important where we're investing in as Bridgeport Capital and Bridgeport Capital is a collection of, you know, tech and gaming entrepreneurs who've just come as a collective who want to support this space, right? So we're investing in the picks and shovels, right? So the infrastructure. So what chain is it built on? You know, uh, do we have multi-chain wallet? Uh, you know, uh, can we figure out, you know, with one of our new investments called Nest, can we figure out the provenance of something, right? So imagine if I was to take Mona Lisa and take a picture and say, I own the Mona Lisa or somebody else for that matter was to take an NFT and say, well, I own this. So we're looking at using an AI engine to validate that item and then be able to say whether it's authentic or not, attach a geolocation to it and then move forward. And the last category, which is the most important and, and Gabriel, you come from this gaming world, right? Which is, play to earn. So yeah. let's think about the third world countries, right? So whether it's Asia or Africa or Latin America, one of our portfolio investments at Bridgeport Capital was Axie Infinity. Wow. And Axie big Infinity- one. Big one, it's the biggest in the world right so now. What, what Axie Infinity did was gave, gave an ability to individuals to be able to earn two to three times what they could be able to earn, right? So in this decentralized manner, where you say my data is my data or my action is my action. And what I mean by centralized versus decentralized is that there's a smart contract that in a, in a, without any bad actors can determine based on your actions what you can earn or cannot earn, right? So I think that play to earn component is becoming very important. And of course, for brands, the metaverse is becoming very big. Right. Is it real? Is it not real? I mean, if you look at the millennials, I don't even know if they're called millennials or something else, but you know, they, they, they live in the metaverse more than they live in the real world. Absolutely. And, and I think it'll be continuing on that trend. I, I know we're limited on time here. So I wanted to get one or two last questions in. Number one, um, looking at the space, um, what is something physical that we can touch? What, what would you see from like, if you would you know, get a ticket at a concert, how could you see that eventually be on a platform that's NFT on chain, you know, from Bridgeport Capital's perspective? So, so as a matter of fact, we're working on a large ticketing platform with one of the leading 
um, messenger businesses, right? So, so what happened in ticketing? So first of all, 20% of the tickets that were sold for, let's say for a concert, for example, right? They were fake. More importantly, if the box office was $10 million, the secondary market of trading of tickets, right? Would be 20 to 30. So generally the rule is two to three times that amount. Now, guess what? The artists never benefited from any of the secondary sales, right? In the old days, if we went to a Rolling Stone concert, we would have a tack board right in the back. We'd yep. pin, the, pin, the, pin the tickets and then we would be, but the value of the ticket would never appreciate other than the fact that we could show off to, you know, the friends who would come over to our place. So I think it, it, it's about creating a secondary market for uh, as a collectible and having a marketplace, number one. Number two, uh, incentivizing the artists that through a smart contract that how many times it moves perpetually, you will earn an X percent, let's say 10% of those revenues. Yep. Number three, uh, creating a, a fan base and a community, and, and, et cetera. And then more importantly, incentivizing that fan base for following you. So it, it is. it is literally... Like in the old days, we used to talk about loyalty points. We yep. used to talk about fans. We used to talk about collectibles. It's all converging through the blockchain. And, and honestly, um, you know, DeFi was, a, was, a, was an interesting use case, but that touches on currencies and, and, and a bunch of other, you know, uh, uh, centralized uh, institutions. But, you know, when it comes to art and when it comes to collectibles, it, it, it's it, the, the the use case is much much broader. Got it. Okay. Right. Or, or, or for example, uh, Gabriel. Right. I mean, we used to be gaming. Right. Twitch. Right. We we watch Twitch, etc. Right. Now all of a sudden, if we can do uh, streaming of esports, where you could incentivize, you can have a fan token, you can donate. You yep. can, you know, it just it's comes. Better for the community, it's better for the gamers, the streamers. Um, and in the end, you can, you know, it's, it's providence on chain. Um, exactly. So one last question. Our audience is watching globally. We've got people in Italy, in California, in New York, Asia as well. Um, how do they reach you guys? How do they pitch Bridgeport? How do, you know, uh, pick an axe businesses come find you? How do the next axes come and find you? Well, um, Gabriel, the, the answer is very clear. Through you. Okay, fine. <laughs> so everybody's watching, send me a note. <laughs> Want to be connected with Sandeep? Uh, no, no, I, I'd be happy to share. We'd be happy yeah. to share our contacts and details. Um, we, we tend to be a, a, a very private group, but yep. we're happy to, to help and talk and collaborate. Um, and, you know, we are doing really, really amazing things. And I think, honestly, Singapore has really, and Asia has become a real, real hub uh, for this kind of blockchain activity. I miss um, it. I mean, I know, I know Singapore, my last company and, and companies that I'm investing now is at the cutting edge um, and, and almost the bleeding edge in Asia of, of pushing forward, not just Asia, but globally of blockchain, both infrastructure, crypto and the DeFi side and NFTs. So Gabriel, uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. If people are looking to participate yes. on the asset side, you know, when it's called OpenSea or Rarible yep. or Mintable, et cetera, the way I would look at it, it's, it's what really is happening is people are building communities, right? So look at it as a preferred equity piece, right? So if you owned CryptoPunks or you owned uh, the Apes, right? Uh, the Yacht Club, right? The Apes. So the reason it's really as a preferred equity is that the amount that the community gives to you as a result of it, of owning that asset is amazing, right? Number one. Number two, these communities are also allowing people to co-brand. So all of a sudden, I want to do a sneaker, right? So if I have an ape, and wow. people can yeah, yeah. me, and yeah. I said, hey, can you license your ape to me? And I'm going to charge you 0.1 ETH, and then I'll put it on a sneaker, and I'll deliver that physical thing. So it's really about empowering. And for me, it's almost like play to earn, which yep. is a big shift in gaming because, you know, in all of these sort of world economies, 
it is extremely empowering. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining. And thank you to Bridgeport um, Capital uh, for sponsoring. I can't wait to make it out to Singapore. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of our panelists who spoke earlier today on NFTs, as well as our attendees reaching out. The future is bright. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel.